So here we are, February 15th. Hey. -o. Trying to stop the flow, the water that's been dripping. Ew. Ew. Coming from right there. That is the source of the flood. We got oh, this. Thanks a lot for your help, man. Sure. And my comic book box got wet, but luckily everything is sealed in plastic bags. I got these fans going. And now we got a maintenance tech that just stopped by, thank God. And just to follow up from the flood last week, uh, this is the box. I had this stupid sticker that I just removed. So let's take care of that. Put that right there. All right, so this is where the water was. Uh, it was on the ground over there. All the furniture in here got removed. Well, I got to bring it back in today. Um, the apartment complex here, Palomino, they were not prepared to handle any type of crisis, any type of situation. They didn't even know how to keep people properly informed. They thought that they were done with the repairs. We had to babysit this process and keep telling them to come back. No, it's not done yet, guys. You still gotta, they still gotta finish the bath, the bathroom. And it's been what <clears throat> the 15th is when it happened. And it's the 26th. It's Friday. So it's the first day of the MSU comics farm. I just wanted to show this real quick to show that there was water damage on this box. But fortunately, even though I don't like these, this huge brand here, because I prefer to put stickers on here and I don't like having this yeah, background. I just prefer it to either be all black or all white. That's just me from my collage work. A little hobby BS thing I do. But as you can see, there was some water damage. And I want to report that BCW protected my comics. I mean, they were already bagged. You know, double bagged. But um, when I opened them up, to look inside just to show you right now I usually put like a backing board in the front a couple of them for protection this is like a magazine size box it gives me extra room to throw in stuff on the side envelopes and stuff but as you can see looks like there's a little bit of a water damage line I don't know if you can see that line right there Huh, not on this side though. It's just on that side. Anyway, let's <clears throat> see this other one here. This first comic in there. There's no water damage. It protected my comics. Is the end all story here. Yeah, this is really the only time I bought a Buffy the Vampire Slayer comic and it's for this cover. All right, I'm not here to show off comics right now. Just want to give props to BCW. Yeah, BCW. Doesn't have the best looking box, but it will protect your comics. You can see the water damage right there. All right, so everything's been just under motherfucking disarray because of the the um, the flood here. The ceiling was totally exposed. I'm sure. Y'all give a shit. Everybody's got their fucking bullshit that they're dealing with. They just finished putting up the lining here. Uh, yeah, we had to totally babysit this process. This past two weeks has been uh, very challenging. Hell no, it hasn't been challenging. I've been broke. I've been fucking going through the fucking mids meat grinder of life. Shit, I swear to God.
Here's a piece of mail. Let's open it up. This is such a crude vid right now, but I'm wanting to do a vid. I can do this one-handed. There's another package somewhere. I have no idea where the hell it is. What do we have a rush? Yeah. Oh yeah, this is exactly what I was hoping it was going to be. This is the, like, I could give a shit about former Marvel anymore, but this is the cover that is done by the creator of Afro Samurai. What is that, $4.99? I paid seven dollars for this plus four bucks shipping. It's like um yeah, eleven dollars holla. Now there is some other covers that he did uh for Marvel around this same time. But this is a more recent cover. I like Daredevil. Um, if there's anyone that's going to have a background with like martial arts or anything Asian related of all the covers that this guy has done, um, it's, it's going to be Daredevil. This is, uh, I, I know that he did a, a cover of, um, I think it was a Captain America comic. It's got Falcon and Winter Soldier on the cover. It, it matches the background of the, the, uh, the creator. So, and who am I talking about exactly? Hold on, let me show you. Hold up, yeah. Hold up. Can I just give you some visual stimulation? Of course, it's in the last box I look. I don't want to sell the state and hard drive. All right. All right. <laughs> Here it is. Takashi Okazaki. And the rest is Samuel Jackson history. Yeah, Samuel Jackson did the voice of Afro Samurai and his imaginary friend Ninja Ninja. I think this is the first American printing of Afro Samurai. There were two volumes of this, one in accordance to each movie. I think the movie aired. It's an episodic series on Spike TV back in the day when that used to exist. Uh, this thing called cable television. It is said that he who wears the number one headband shall rule the world. It is also told that only he who wears the number two headband may challenge the number one. As far as I know, there is no American printing that is, uh, as we would say, backwards. Right, but there you go. A little bit of a haul. MSU Comics Forum Notice. Please check it out. Please subscribe. Please give them a like. Check out their vids, their keynote speakers. You'll notice there's a lot of indie comic book creators that they've had speak. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in real quick. MSU Comics Forum. Give them a like, a subscription. Never drop those expressions, but for with the MSU Comics Forum, it's such a great thing. Please check it out. Thanks.
is uh, yeah I am not up for this right now so thanks for watching if you get a chance check out the MSU comics forum check out Takashi Okazaki's artwork online peace what is up be that sequential geek yo welcome to sequential hood just want to get a couple of shout outs in this video so the past month though has been fucking hell uh, dealing with loved one that's not doing well dealing with the flood that happened all things said and done took them two weeks from the time the flood happened on the 15th up until uh, just like a week ago until they got everything cleaned up yeah lease is ending running on options running on the funds um is what it is. Life is what life is right now, and it is nothing to brag about. Um, just trying to work in a video. Haven't really been centered enough to feel like I can get anything done, but yeah, fucking last month has been something else. Jesus. Want to recap a little bit here with this Afro Samurai. Um, just to take a quick look here at the at the creator, Okazaki, uh, Takashi Okazaki, uh, from Japan. Let's take a look. Yeah, in one of the DVDs that comes with that um, box, two disc set uh, with Afro Samurai. He says in an interview that he sent out, I think one of the producers actually said in an interview that um, Takashi Okazaki had sent out something like 200 or 250 of these like figurines, statuettes, something real simple. Today it looks like it, you could have done it with a 3D printer. Um, I think it might have only just been like one color. And he said he had a bunch of them on his shelf and he was looking for ideas, something new to produce. And when he saw the statue, it piqued his curiosity and he decided that he was going to go ahead and move forward with a interview with Takashi Okazaki after he looked up some Afro Samurai comics and he liked what he saw saw the potential it's pretty amazing how huh? just throwing yourself out there throwing in some new concepts as like a, a freebie uh, promoting yourself with a statue something that you know is going to sit on a producer's shelf um, I think what guys like Matt Stone and Trey Parker the guys that created South Park they did that Christmas card that little South Park Christmas card that they gave away. That little video that went viral. It's like one of the first viral videos, right? That South Park promo vid those two guys did. Some little, like, uh, Christmas card video. So Takashi Okazaki, eventually um, his, his character got popular. The name of the comic is actually called Now Now How? N-O-U, N-O-U, H-A-U. I don't know, pronounce that as you will, but that was the name of this um, manga anthology, this this manga news magazine. Uh, now, now how? That's got the first appearance of Afro Samurai. His hair was originally green. And the first time Afro Samurai is in print in English, this book opens up, you know, like a regular Western piece of literature. That was in 2008. Take a look at the back. This is in great condition. I got this a few months ago. <clears throat> Just over a hundred bucks. It's really difficult to get this in VF or better. I think with all things said and done with shipping, it was like 115. Uh, it's my second copy and that is under, that's Seven Seas Entertainment. You can see that ship that's right there on the spine. My shitty camera. Yeah, Seven Seas. There were two movies that were made, Afro Samurai. 
Afro Samurai Resurrection. The Riz did the soundtrack. And he said he set up the soundtrack specifically to be Ron Perlman's character, like that cowboy represented rock and roll, and Afro Samurai's father was more soul, uh, funk. And then he said Afro represented hip hop, uh, like the merge of soul and funk with rock and roll. Now there's another printing of this book, a couple of other printings. And if you see the one that says like Carlson Media, um, Carlson Manga, that printing is from 2011. And then there's like another printing of this that came out where uh, instead of red, it's black. And that's out of 2010. Samuel Jackson did the voice for Afro Samurai and this imaginary friend that he ended up creating from this like post traumatic stress devastating experience he had when he was young studying to become a samurai check out the movie they go through it and that's Carlson Manga that did like that second printing but yeah the Japanese manga mag now now how N-O-U N-O-U H-A-U now I don't know how to pronounce that but Takashi Okazaki Hit a home run with this character. And then the second book for this, that also got printed around the same time, uh, 2008. Eventually, Takashi Okazaki ended up getting commissioned to do some covers for Marvel, and this is the only one that I thought was really cool. Uh, I just got one copy, so... Yeah, cover price is $5.00. Just Daredevil with his martial arts background. Just that whole image right there. That looks like total Takashi Okazaki artwork. Something totally fitting I could see him enjoy doing. And, uh, yeah, that was around like 11 bucks, 10 bucks, I think. And that's a Eternals variant cover. Cover B for the third printing. And that hit shops in January 2021 this year. All right. So I went to one comic book shop so far this year. I hit up Vision Comics and Oddities. Only spent $10. And these are the 10 comics that I got. First shout out that I want to give is to Street Smart Joker. He's a comic book collector out of India. He's been showing off some really beautiful comic books from India and also stuff that he gets from the United States. There is this one Indian publication that he just recently posted. Just check it out for yourself. He flips through it. He's got some nice music playing in the background. Uh, it's just a nice review of this really amazing, beautiful comic book. The name of the book is called Krishna, A Journey Within. By Abhishek Singh. It's fucking amazing book review. So he, this guy, his name's Jagadesh. Uh, I just call him Jag. Uh, hit him up. It's a really nice guy. Uh, him and Neo Comics. Neo Comics does some comic book reviews for both India and the States. It's a great idea of just seeing what one of the world's largest markets is interested in. Uh, it's really cool websites, uh, YouTube channels. Street Smart Joker, Street Smart Joker, by the way, he's in English. Uh, Neo Comics is a mixture of Hindi and English. I don't speak Hindi, but it's just fun to check it out. Um, the Phantom is extremely popular in India. I was, I was told, I've been informed, by Jack. And I'm just going to set up some uh, little care package for him, send him some American comics. Um, this, you know, it's just something random I got, but I did see that King's publication, uh, King Features Syndicate, if you can see that. This is from 2005, by the way. The Phantom issue number seven. But King Features owns the rights to the Phantom. This is written by Ben Robb and penciled by Pat Quinn. The colors are by Joe Bucho, B-U-C-C-O, Buco. 
And I gotta say, Joe, man, lighten it up just a little bit. I dig that this is happening at night, but all this is so dark. The whole story altogether I liked. Uh, it was fun. You got these three ladies. Uh, they're communicating with their HQ, which is this woman that's uh, telling them what to do as far as hijacking this plane. I got some poisonous gas going in there. I just thought it was fun. Um, this is the Phantom, this, this rich guy right here. I think his name is Kit Carlson, but I don't know much about the Phantom. I got this just because I know that it, it's the Phantom's popular in India, and I figure I'm going to send this over to Jag. And hopefully I'll send my ass some comics back. Let's see if we can do a trade, you know. Uh, these three women, you know, each one's got like a certain type of weapon. She's got the staff. With, it shoots out electricity on each end. And uh, there's the Phantom. Got a hell of an angle looking at this. It's just some of the graphics here are just the lighting. I don't know, now looking at it like this. It's not so bad, but just like his purples kind of blend in with the background a little bit too much for me. I like how this one woman has this like chain linked knife weapon. The art on that battle scene is pretty cool. And then it's revealed right at the end. This girl's like... Referring to him as dad, so we got the first cameo of his daughter. Uh, Moonstone is the publication label that King's Feature is using to print these here in the States, or for whatever reason back in 2005, but some of these other titles, how boring is that? Just dude standing there with the flashlight. Little gremlin guy down there, I guess. Uh, some of these other covers aren't looking too great, but Khan, that book looks great. Um, Silencers, Buckaroo Banzai. Definitely a hit from the 80s. But um, never got into Phantom. I'd have to say that he's kind of got this like slapstick sense of humor while he's kicking ass. Um, the artwork of oh, just showing like the uniform, the technical aspects of the jumpsuits that these women are wearing while they're hijacking and jump off the plane to, to glide down and just the architecture, the design of this, this jet that the enemy right there is using for part of their hijack. I just think it would have given it a lot more justice if it wasn't so purple. I mean, I dig that the, uh, the Phantom's purple, but I think it washed out a lot of the great details of that design of that jet. Anyway, it was a worthwhile read for a buck. It was quick. This guy's just some tech genius. He's in the plane that's getting hijacked. But yeah, uh, for something new to check out, it's a quick read for a dollar. Little FYI out there for y'all to check out Street Smart Joker. Like I said, his channel's in English, and he's got some great reviews. Underwater, number eight. This is 11-issue limited series. I don't know if it was meant to be limited or how far they plan on going with it. I don't really know much about Chester Brown. Um, I did a vid a little while ago about George Harriman. Um, you know, if you know, like, the Ignatz Award... Ignatz is that mouse that throws the brick always at Crazy Cat. This is like 100 years ago, 110 years ago. It's, it does it as a sign of endearment. It's all this irony that's packed into just like a two or three panel comic book strip that George Harriman did way back when. Uh, anthropomorphic type of uh, character-based assets. And uh, you had Walt Disney that hit it big with more of a commercialized version of that concept. And then George Harriman... He also hit it big. He had cartoons that were being played at um, trailers in front of movies. He had his own float at Thanksgiving Parade, for example. But um, he was a lot more intellectual, and he created kind of his own language, uh, is what I'm getting at. I know that Chester Brown is from Canada. Um, don't know too much about Chester Brown. If anybody can give me some feedback, um, let me know. Uh, I know that he's world-renowned, and... 
when I saw this comic book, I figured it's a great opportunity to try out something new because it's only a buck. So when I was talking about George Harriman, he created his own language pretty much with Crazy Cat. Um, he, had, he studied Greek tragedies, philosophers. Um, he, he learned Greek and Latin. He already knew a mixture of Creole, Spanish, French, um, languages influenced from like the Yoruba tribe, other parts of Africa. So by the time he was doing Crazy Cat, he kind of implemented this own, his own language. Um, he studied uh, the classics, he, uh, that educated background mixed with all different forms of languages that he learned came out in Crazy Cat. Chester Brown kind of incorporates the same idea. I'm not sure the background on the language, but um, it's definitely this almost phonetically spelled um, kind of a slang, just his own language of, of this family. It's, it is avant, avant-garde, uh, different. This is new to me. I've only looked through this just for a few moments, um, but I wanted to try something new. And as you can say, can see, even just the panel work is different. Um, if you can read that, but in the top left panel, yeah. How well can we get this in here? You are here, Laura. Come, Kupifam. You are here. Come on. Okay, do you know how to do this? No. Zolf the Nebai brush in the pal. Then brush it in your yaf. Yo, know, you can see that this is like <sighs> his family is trying to tell him to then push it in your yaf. Then push it in your mouth. Like, almost like, is this like a Yiddish? I know the language is in Yiddish, all right? But I'm just saying, like, uh, just the accent, the, I don't know, mixture of German and whatever else, Yiddish type of language. Um, just trying to pull this out because it does sound kind of dramatic. I'm not looking at a lot of phonetically sounding Latin words here, but... Okay, you dab that. And I'll go get you. And the kid's saying no, is resisting. And then we have panels here without any type of words. And as you can see, I don't know, is that a cookie jar with just that face in the background? Like ominously smiling, knowing what's about to happen. The kid complies and eats his food. You know, it's like it's spelt how they're how they're pronounced. He's sitting out in the rain. He looks almost like the yellow kid uh, from like, the first comic book character. I think first appeared in advertisements and then eventually had its own strip. This issue of Underwater is from 1996, December. 1996. I think it was originally uh, printed in Canada. Yeah, printed in Canada. Drawn in quarterly. Drawn in quarterly publication. He's sitting out there in the rain and then this like Martian alien antennae being, this, this girl comes up, and it's not being rained on at all. It's completely dry. She says, let's go. And then it's almost like it was a dream maybe because the kid is being woken up by its parents out of the crib. And it's, why are you nabod in your treen poopa fam? You really got to like repeat some of these sentences over and over again to get an idea by looking at the context of the image of what they're talking about. I think the kid's name is Koopafan. She says, come, Koopafan. 
You are here, come on. Okay, do you know how to do this? She says no. Zulf the Nabi, bush it in the pall. Wow. So sorry, but as you can see, it's very interesting. Now the whole comic isn't like this. The Koopa Farm and his family. And then at the end, you've got this like, biblical story, but check this out. Don't the scribes say that Elijah has to reappear on earth before the Messiah, right? Go to the next page. This man's like, yes, and they say that he'll restore all things. But Elijah has already reappeared, and they didn't recognize him. They killed him, and they're going to kill me too. And these guys whisper, who got killed? I think he's talking about John the Baptist. That guy looks up at him and says, and he just walks on. This person is saying that this man, he brings him to him and he says, his son couldn't get cured. And then he yells, come out of that boy. But it's interesting right here. He says, how much longer will I have to put up with these faithless people? And the look on his face, it's just like, ugh. And this little creature comes out of the boy's mouth, lands on the ground. And he's just like, had enough. And these, these people are like, why couldn't we get the demon out? He says, because you have no faith. If you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you'd be able to move mountains. Nothing would be impossible for you. Galilee and he's saying he's going to be betrayed by the hands of my enemies they will kill me and three days later I will rise and this guy's like that's terrible in Capernaum Capernaum this man's yelling Simon hold on a second he's like you haven't paid two drachmas yet for the temple tax. Then he's like, oh yeah, we got it. Don't worry, we'll, 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 we'll get you. This guy's like, well, you better have it next time I see you. And Steve's like, yeah. Simon, he says, do kings collect taxes from their sons or from other people? He says, uh, other people. That's right, sons should be exempt, but we don't want to offend anyone. Go to the lake and cast out your net. Take the first fish you catch and open its mouth. Inside you'll find a shekel. Use it to pay your tax and mine. And there's Chester right to me, Toronto. Toronto, Ontario. Three fifty US, four twenty five Canada, drawn in quarterly publications. Wow, I'm intrigued. I want more. Haven't really looked at. Haven't really looked at that till now. Just that last story I saw, but the first part of it. It's interesting. I'm digging it. Not your typical commercialized sequential, right? All right. Next up, the Wachowski brothers. Doc Frankenstein. You know the Bukowski brothers from V, V for Vendetta, the Alan Moore adaptation, and of course the Matrix trilogy. Yeah, yeah. This came out, covered eight November 2004 from Burly Man Entertainment. Uh, some of these ten, this this uh, this ten bucks I spent. Some of these I'm going to be reading. Some of them I'm going to be giving away. And some I'm just going to keep as collectibles and bag and board. 
to keep them sealed up till I find a reader copy. This one I already got. Just what I got one copy of this already. So, um, created by Jeff Duro and Steve Scorch, Scorche, Scorse. Written by the Bukowski brothers. So the cover um, and the inks, art, illustration, interiors, and covers by Steve Scor Scorche. Issue number one, cover date, November 2004. Burley Man Entertainment. Yeah, the artwork in this is awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a cinematic. Dun, dun. All right. Ray right, Jeff Darrow. Written and illustrated by Jeff Darrow, Shaolin Cowboy. Check it out. Wow, issue number one came out in 2004. Uh, same year as this, Burly Man Entertainment. I recommends it. Right. Let's keep it going. Satan 6. Does anybody know anything interesting about this cover? Yeah. The Satan 6. This is what caught my eye. See that? Art by Jack Kirby. Finished inks, Todd McFarlane. This is uh, Topps Comics. It's still in the poly bag. Synopsis out of comics.org. Tired of living in limbo, five souls are too bad to go to heaven, too good to go to hell. They make a deal with Odious Commodious go to earth and secure human souls for Satan and they'll be released from limbo. Of course, corrupting humans for Satan will assure them a place in hell. So Pristine, a guardian angel with a mean streak, watches over the team to make sure they only help people. Sounds like a great concept for a movie, for a TV show. How about a great concept for a motherfucking comic book? How about just that? <laughs> so yeah, one dollar. Satan 6, such a fucking cool ass title. Something, anybody out there is a venture capitalist, and you're looking for something cool to invest to, invest into, you got yourself the uh, Damon Hellstrom, supposed to be making an appearance in the uh, Sad Strange Academy. Well, with all that horror, strange magic shit that's going on, shall invest in some of that Jack Kirby, Satan 6. It's actually uh, two stories. 14 pages by Tony Isabella. It's the script. Pencils by John Cleary. Then you got another 10-page story by Jack Kirby. Script, pencils, and the inks by Mike Royer. Frank Pillar. Frank Miller actually inked page six. Fucking A. Steve Dicko inked page 13 in that. Joe Sinna. Big time. Fantastic Four anchor for Kirby and John Byrne, Joe Sinnott inked page 14, Terry Austin did page 7, fucking A, you want to get your ink on, see how well they did on Mr. Jack Kirby, check out Satan 6, me, I'm low on funds, right, if I don't got a reader copy, I'm not opening it up, uh, that's why I like the dollar holidays, you can get yourself some good deals, but uh, you can also get yourself some great reader copies without spending lots of money. This time, I'm not opening this up. Uh, you know, I, I, I do believe in collecting, but I also don't mind flipping. And if I can flip this for even $5 in five years, I'll be happy. Oh, shit, man. Times ain't getting any better. Uh, yeah. Madman Adventures. This one, I already have a copy of, and it's a, this is in red. The collectible of this is when this is gold. This uh, shiny back. Yeah, so that's, you see that in gold? That's the one that, that that's money. Um, this one came out in 1996. So, right, it's during the old foil, hollow foil cover craze. 
and this is the Ashcan version of uh, Madman Adventures. And yeah, January 1996. So the first appearance of Frank Einstein, he's the guy that becomes Madman. It's in Creatures of the Id, right? But um, I think that's around like... Creatures of the Id came out by Michael Allred, published by Caliber Press with a cover date of January 1990. So... I got printed in 1989. So this one's going to be cool to open up. Another one I haven't looked at yet. But I got myself a reader copy. This baby. Um, yeah, Mike Allred. You might know him as the artist on Ecstatics. Written by Peter Milligan. Among other things, like that Silver Surfer comic book where him and that chick went out. Traveled Space, that girl from Maine. This is some zany shit. I'm not feeling that whole red outfit here. I haven't read this. So I don't know why. He's got it. But the artwork is still great. You know the story is going to be kick-ass because it is written by Mike Allred. Mike Allred, he had his own label called um, Atomic Comics. And he created this group, uh, like his own universe, his own Madman universe. Madman would make appearances occasionally in this comic called The Atomics. Um, I featured it in some earlier vids not too long ago. Um, first appearance of It Girl, I think it's issue number three of Atomics. But, um, uh, was it called Atomic Comics? No, it was called Triple A Pop. So we got Mad Mad Adventures. This is the ash can that is printed by Kitchen Sink Comics. It's another character based asset that started off with Caliber Press and went over to Kitchen Sink. Like, what is it? The Crow started off with Caliber Press. And then that uh, four issue limited series was printed by Kitchen Sink. Don't you know? Mad Mad Adventures. 1996, yo. So this one comes in a poly bag. It's red, right? And then there's a gold one that comes in a poly bag, but you know the gold one that doesn't originally come in a poly bag because the one that originally comes in a poly bag has a little uh, embossed stamp in the lower corner. It says official hero original seal. It's like a seal deal. That's the money one. Uh, this one, this is a decent reader, reader copy. So if you see something with a hollow foil that's red, it's nothing special about it. Um, maybe it's special. It's got a limited print run because it's an ash can, but comics are to be read and eventually given away. Uh, most of my Dalla Hall stuff is, so. That's a giver. We got ourselves here. First appearance of Ninjak. Colin King, the guy that's Ninjak, his first appearance is in Bloodshot issue number six. This is issue number seven, cover date, August 1993. And that cover, illustration, and inks and interiors are done by Don Perlin and Joe Dixon. And that story is written by Kevin Van Hook. Valiant first print of Colin King as Ninjak. Yeah, first print of Colin King all suited up. Another thing I wanted to note about Ninjak is that there is on YouTube a video called Ninjak vs. the Valiant Universe. The complete web series. You can get the whole thing. It's like an hour and 12 minutes, 53 seconds. Go check that out. It is a pretty low budget take on the Valiant Universe that was done very well, so... Uh, let me know what you think. Runaways number one. Back to that. You know, I like these Halloween comic fests. It's like a, a lot of these Halloween comic fest prints are first printings of, I, um, of a reprint. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, all the variant covers aside with Darth Vader number three, I think the first reprint of Dr. Aphra's first appearance is the Halloween comic fest issue reprint of Darth Vader number three. Anyway, this came out in 2017 and it is a reprint of the first 
appearance, the first issue of Runaways Number 1, written by Brian K. Vaughn and penciler Adrian Alfona. Brian Reavers is the colorist on that. It's a great job, I gotta say. Traitor, right? His family's tech. She's from another planet. Uh, she's like super invulnerable, uh, strong, like mutant, I believe. Um, whenever she bleeds, her magic is at its highest strength. Basically, that's initially how she could only really utilize her magic. And Gertie over there, she's got that pet dinosaur that she can control, I believe. Her parents are time travelers. Uh, it's a um, raptor. Ragtag team of kids that find out that their parents are villains and uh, go on the run. Away. That's right. That was for a buck. Now, let me show y'all something here real quick. Ten ways to tell if a comic book speculator is a fraud. Check out this video. It is so good. Um, you know, Howler Mouse, you can go off on a rant for a minute. Uh, I added 10 more things of my own uh, right here. I added to his 10. He said, yeah, go draw me. Let me know what your 10 are. So I said, people that mention optioned for a movie, TV show a lot, and variant covers are given way too much, way too much uh, attention there. We at the comic book community, people that drop that all the time, then they block people. Uh, who try and question their remarks, and they never bother to provide feedback as to why. Any type of warning. Uh, people act disappointed about going to a grungy comic book shop or getting a book back as a 9-6. Uh, people who push their merchandise while in the same breath they're talking about how they need a super chat. Uh, what else we got here? Yeah. Right here, we got number five. Uh, looks like it's... Oh, they're bragging about stuff that's autographed, which is fine as a collector, but... It's no real profound flip if it's just got some flimsy certificate. It's not even remarked. Uh, number six, they claim to hunt, yet they have a relationship with a shop owner, so they usually get the first dibs. Um, they also claim to buy a book for a buck, but they neglect to mention usually that it's part of a large haul. And even if they do and you factor it in as a, as a dollar or a buck fifty each, I mean, that's, that's not really hunting, though. Um, uh, I can be, but saying that you hunted this and you got this for a buck, but you had to buy it as a whole, not everybody's got $300 to throw down on a long box or 150 on a short box. So yeah, I think it's good. It's good reference, you know, for when you eventually can get some funds. But uh, as far as the average hunter, I don't know how typical that is. Number eight, they base their vids off another top 10 list. And by the time you hear about it, it's really too late anyway. And you know, everybody is talking about cover price top 10 list. I dig how um, just the delivery that Lords of the Lawn Box have for that. But it, the, you know, DJ Curse, shout out to DJ Curse. Thank you so much for the Lords of the Lawn Box. Yeah, uh, the cover price resource, um, that brings me to another point I was going to mention too down below. But um, I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, everybody's using cover price, and then people got what Key Comics Market Watch or Key Comics Watch. Key Comics Market Watch is a YouTube channel. Actually, shout out to that cat. You're the best dog. But uh, people have another app they use. They swipe. It's called like Key Comic Collector or something, and they use that in shops. And so it's getting to the point where a shop owner, hopefully, they'll go through their collection first and reprice stuff. Or if they do it at the register, they're total schmucks, and you should. Just tell them that it's not fair and leave your comics on the table or take just a third of it and never go back. And number nine, the channel claims eBay prices listed instead of at least claiming what is, you know, when they say the value of something, they should base it off of what is sold or completed. Um, which brings me back to cover price, one of my complaints. Uh, number 10, real quick, they are not ETA Nick. He is the quant, the man, the real motherfucking deal. Uh, Number 11, uh, our time is taken advantage of um, just because people are always hogging up our 
alerts because they want to be relevant. They want to keep getting in our face. They got uh, vids about stuff that they really don't need to mention all the time. Or they could combine it into one or just don't really need to be notified about some of that stuff that often. And um, let's say for 12, um, they sneak in a lengthy promo at the beginning. They always insert some advertisement at our own expense. Uh, A-OKs -OK way too often pushing other channels. Um, some of that stuff is more than just a shout out. It's more like an advertisement. You know, I do not visit YouTube so that I can be inundated with your recommendations, quote unquote, or your sponsor shout outs for the first five minutes. So I normally just skip the first five minutes of a lot of those vids anyway. And uh, yeah, the end thing here I'm saying is that n now that everyone is using cover price for their hype vids, someone will sell a comic book to a friend for an inflated amount just so that sale will leak will reach the top shakers 10 list. So what good are lists that are based on top single sales by price sold each week? You know what I'm saying? Like, so my point with that cover price deal is, is that somebody will sell something like Marvel previews, that first appearance of Miles Morales as um, a Spider-Man and that previews is making the bucks. But, you know, um, people say you, you you have a choice. You, you, it's your choice. I dig that, and but I'm. I think that um, the wisdom and choice, uh, an adult choice. It's not based off of instant gratification and uh, impulsiveness. You know, we live in a country where we're bred to be impulsive and seek instant gratification, and um, that FOMO uh, is uh, is big here. And yeah, you grow out of it, but, um, you know, each country grows out of things at, at different rates than others, I think. And yeah, there's a, there's a reason that why we're the number one opioid market here in the world. You know what I'm saying? Like at the same time, everybody's all about brands and, and buying and shopping and FOMO and all that. So yeah, I mean, people have got a choice, but you know, the housing subprime market didn't just suddenly happen to happen all at once all over the United States. Right. Um, Need I say more? Basically, just want to move forward here and point out how in Howler Mouse's vid, he was pointing out one of the signs that you can tell that people are a hype machine is when people do the uh, Marvel previews and they're trying to hype up having a Marvel previews as if it's that's as if it's some type of real first appearance, which I don't really count it as a first appearance. But hey, I got this for a buck. I'm not saying I'm going to be able to flip this uh, the next time there's a dark rain television show or, or, or movie appearance for, you know, $500, $600. But damn, holla, 20 bucks. If I can flip this for $10 for just a buck initial uh, investment. Yeah, that's worth it. Uh, not a lot of spine ticks. Corners are looking sharp. Uh, actually, no spine ticks. So, yeah. I'm sure there's somebody, even if I could sell that for five bucks or trade bait, whatever. Um, that whole Miles Morales um, money grab with his appearance and previews, that's something right there. That's another aspect to the hobby that, that that's uh, being added. Um, it'll ebb and flow. It'll come and go. But I got me a Marvel previews of Dark Avengers first appearance. Shout out to Holler Mouse. I'll sell this to you for 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah, uh, this one is an investment. Yeah, um, at least I'm going to worry about the condition enough to not open it. So I can use it as either trade bait or to even sell it for five or ten bucks. Um, luckily, 20. This one... It's probably the first reprint of Runaways, I believe, the Halloween Comic Fest. Definitely, I'm keeping that. Keeping the Bloodshot, number seven. Uh, first Ninjak appearance. Definitely a Satan Six. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, I'm reading the Doc Frankenstein. Yes, I'll be giving that away eventually. This Underwater 8 looks super interesting by Chester Brown. Yep. yep. Phantom, giving that away with the uh, Mad Men Adventures. Definitely going to add that to the to India as well as with uh, these two comics right here. These next two I'm going to show. And then that will wrap it up. Um, this is the 
Second volume of Ultimates, the first two are the ones to read as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's a variant cover for volume three. It's uh, got a white background with BP on the cover. I think that's by Madwera. That's a collectible worth getting, but this is the grand finale of the whole um, Brian Hitch doing the art and Mark Millar story that, you know, when this came out, this was that new Marvel era, that NU Marvel, new Marvel is one word, this little mini renaissance that was happening with comics and, you know, Mark Millar and Brian Hitch were just coming off the authority and their, their run on that was super successful, especially, I think, starting with issue number 13. Um, Frank quietly did the artwork with Mark Millar's story on this evil version of the Avengers. Um, issues 13 and 14, 15 maybe even, is definitely worth checking out. Um, this right here, this Ultimates run, so issue number two is also um, a great issue to get from volume one. It's the first appearance of Nick Fury with uh, Samuel Jackson's likeness. Uh, I think that first appearance of Nick Fury, people were saying um, the Ultimates version of Nick Fury is that Marvel team up issue six, I think. Five or six, issue six. But the one that has the likeness of Samuel Jackson is issue two of volume one. Now I got this in the dollar bin just to show off. This is, I'm going to send this to Jag out in uh, India. Shout out again to Street Smart Joker. It's all one word, but you know, this is the culmination to Loki playing his tricks. This was February 2009, by the way. Mike Dodato artwork. February 2007 cover date. Brian Hitch artwork for the interiors with Paul Neary inks. Just wanted to show off the reason I got this. Definitely a reader copy. I think I already have four copies of this. I got doubles of direct edition or volumes one through two. And now I'm working on getting doubles of newsstand editions. And now the newsstand of these babies is so hard to get. You had a low print run of um, comics during the new Marvel era. Like 99, 2000, till around like 2004, 2005. And the big deal with that era, as opposed to like five years earlier or five years later, is a lot of the stuff that's going on during that time, nobody had seen before. Uh, it was super new, these modern takes on uh, superheroes, bringing people back. They were getting it done right, bringing, bringing old school readers back into comics and people that got sick and tired of a lot of these hypes and gimmicks and... It was a short period of time where characterization and plot, artwork, it was all valued at the same time. The, the writer and the artist, it, um, shit was booming with ideas and uh, sales were slowly going up. So. so this story, this is, you know, Ultimates Volume 2, Issue 13, they each ran for 13 issues. And this is the culmination, right? The climax. And you got this amazing spread right here. The battle is taking place. Whoa, this folds out. Each side folds out once, twice, three times. Okay. Glare City. I. You have Pietro appearing multiple times throughout this image, right? He's so fast. Oh boy. Amazing. Yeah, by this time. They were not coming out monthly. At first they did, but as you can see with Brian Hitch's work. Just with a lot of the schedule games they were playing with Marvel. They were playing at Marvel, just a lot of stuff wasn't coming out on time. This one was definitely well worth the wait.
Scarlet Witch. Janet Van Dyne in the background right there. Giant form, giant size form right there. Nick Fury and the Black Widow right there. Loki asks, can't you see the funny side of all this? Whew. And as a finale, classic X-Men number 16. It's a reprint of Uncanny X-Men number 109. First appearance of Vindicator, Weapon Alpha. Arthur Adams cover with Terry Austin inks for the interiors. Uh, it's a reprint. Um, this comic, Classic X Men, came out cover date December 1987, but yeah, it's a reprint from February 1978. It's cover date on uh, X Men number 109. All right, so Terry Austin did the inks for the entire story, except that the artwork. It's done by John Byrne. And look at that. Man, this is such classic goodness. They just came back from, I think, pretty much another galaxy. Shares Empire resides. They're out in space. Oh, you know that story about how Nightcrawler was originally a concept to be in Legion of Superheroes. And it ended up, it was Dave Cockrum. Not sure the exact story, but I know that he ended up at Marvel. And this outfit right here, isn't this like Timberwolf Wolf or somebody? That originally is from uh, like a Legion of Superheroes, one of the characters from that, that look. Not sure, but I do know this is what kind of like what I'm talking about when I say, on a different note, we're talking about Wolverine. Let me look at his eyes. That is not somebody that looks like your first impulse of what a superhero would look like, which is cool. You know, everybody else is all cheery being back. Except for Moira McTaggart. Look at her looking at Nightcrawler. To take a uh, modern 21st century interpretation. Yeah, look at that. Take a break. She's pushing her, her homo sapien norms onto Nightcrawler. Telling him how she doesn't like him teleporting in the house. He's like trying to be friendly with her. But my point is, is that uh, the whole thing is done by John Byrne, except for Kieran Dwyer does uh, pages six, seven, eight, and pages twenty-one. Uh, John Bolton does the backup story. Every classic X Men book, every classic X Men reprint is just gonna have this backup story. The one here's um, how. Banshee and him and his brother, Black Tom, fall for the same girl. But the main thing I wanted to point out is just some of these characteristics of the John Byrne, Chris Claremont era. Chris Claremont obviously wrote this. He had the longest run on the X-Men. The longest run of... One of the longest runs of a writer on a book, I believe, if not the longest. It's definitely something I got to check out. I got to look that up. Once again, look at Wolverine. Not the friendliest looking guy. Everybody just got back. Uh, Jean Grey's parents are waiting to talk to her. She reveals that she is a mutant to her parents. Here it's revealed that she doesn't want to tell Scott that his parents are, his, Corsair is his father. Uh, I think it's another aspect of the Phoenix Force. It's kind of 
having her keep secrets, not being truthful, uh, slowly ebbing out of her character. She doesn't want Scott to join them. So we cut now to James McDonald Hudson, founder of Alpha Flight from Canada. And this is when we're slowly getting pieces of Logan's history. And he's talking about how he's working with Logan. He's getting butterflies in his stomach. How he's, he's got to bring Logan back to be part of um, Weapon Alpha, Alpha Flight. And he does indicate right here, though, saying how he's the complete warrior, skeleton bonded with adamantium to make your bones virtually unbreakable. Right here he notes, added to that adamantium claws housed in your forearms, extended to retract with a thought, added to that adamantium claws housed in your forearms. Initially, these claws, if you look at the first edition of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe for Wolverine, these were bionic implants. And I like that better. I like that mixture of science fiction technology with the powers. Same thing with Spider-Man. Um, the web shooters are not organic originally. Uh, like with Tobey Maguire. Or the Ultimate Universe. The Landers coming back. Acclimating their first time on Earth. She gets wet. With Charles, they're getting down. It's interesting how, like, with Scott Summers is tripping out on um, Jean Grey not inviting him to meet her parents, and she's revealing herself, and he gives some backhanded remark, pretty much telling uh, Nightcrawler to chill out. He's like, life isn't swashbuckling adventure and circus stunts. It's a great description of characterization right here of, uh, of Nightcrawler's character where he has replied to Scott Summers being so dismissive towards his attitude. I mean, if the guy looks like this from birth, he's either going to have to learn how to be happy, which can go over the edge sometimes, or he's explaining how, how he's just either that or he's going to living like that is just going to get the better of him and he loses his mind. Uh, pretty cool he's just saying i learned early on that i must either accept what i am or go mad and though i, I am now occasionally crazy i am not insane then down there i just says if you keep tearing your guts out every time you think the world shafted you my friend you'll destroy not only yourself but those who love you see Nightcrawler had character. He didn't cover himself with scars around with him and wear his problems on his sleeve uh, every single time. I mean, he, he, he wasn't perfect. There's actually a backup story on another issue of Classic X-Men where he does express uh, the stress, the anxiety that he has from standing out all the time, never being able to fit in. And uh, he's given this, like, hologram device where like a wristband a watch or something that allows him to look human and uh, the the extra story that's that's added in the back it's like an extra 10 pages he chooses to walk around this one town without using it um just to be confident on his own which is pretty awesome so it was a great story um they're by uh john bolton I'm not sure if all of them were but Great shot of Wolverine. These people are going to go on a picnic. Um, Wolverine just says, ask them to have him drop him off at this one island nearby where he wants to go hunt. And Storm's calling him out on actually killing an animal. And he's like, I just actually want to go up and see how close I can get to it. He says, I said nothing about killing. It takes no skill to kill. What takes skill is sneaking up close enough to... 
a skittish deer to touch her. And Oro apologized that she misjudged him. Of course, he says he could care less. You've all been misjudging me since the day I joined this outfit. See what I'm saying? Like, he's not the typical acting, looking superhero. And, um, yeah, he's definitely changed a lot through the, through the decades. I hope the movie version of Logan brings him back to his roots. I'd say that's a necessity for maintaining the, uh, it's that cooler brand identity the X-Men always had. Here we got skin, both Colossus and Storm. Styling it up sexy. Till Wolverine gets knocked into that tree. So they come to his aid fighting Vindicator. So, just wanted to show off just the uh, the pace of these stories. Um, still having axe characterization while also throwing in some excitement. Yo, so these are all Terry Austin inks. Um, and like I said, what was that? Kieran Dwyer did pages six. Eight. Let's let's check out six eight and then did the last one six eight. That was the one where I showed. See, there's Findigator was scoping out his data on Wolverine, psyching himself up. So that is Kieran D W Y E R Dwyer. That is six. Here is page seven. Six and seven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap this baby up. There's eight. All right. So, that flows pretty well for changing up the artist in the original story. So, there's ten comics for ten bucks. And that is my haul. I have been feeling like I'm underwater lately. And uh, thankfully the weather's getting warmer out here in Denver. There's a lot more sunnier days than dark, dreary ones lately. So uh, actually rained here for the first time that I've been here in six months just recently. And damn, that was nice. Uh, just like some nice warm air with that rain. I'm used to that being from the Midwest. Howler Mouse, eat your heart out. <laughs> Thanks for swinging by this party, y'all. Sequential Hood. Peace. Stay safe.